Matt, are you, are you gone? Are you host, your host muted me. Oh, she did. <laughs> now I'm here. It won't let me turn my video on. Oh, really? Let me see if I can do it. Yeah, okay, I get it. Yeah, I came in and yeah, you, you appeared to be hiding from me. And uh, I, I was trying to go to the bathroom, but I can wait. No, go. You no, 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 no. I'm fine. Well, what's going on below the waist there? Can't you I'm just good, let I'm it rip? I'm good now. <laughs> Um, I'm good. I just, uh, it's nice to just get up and walk for uh, a few seconds between these. Uh, it's been, Is that how bad it's been, eh? It's been nine hours. <laughs> Why did you do this to yourself? I thought I needed, <laughs> I thought I needed the money. You thought you needed the money. Well, don't you see, this is God's great prank on you. He gave you the money right before and then still made you suffer. Although, who knows? Did you, did you wind up raising the money you needed? Yeah. Bingo. What did you need, like $10,000? 50. Dude, a lot of responsibility. <laughs> it's just now I have to make it. Uh, you'll be fine. Are you kidding me? Wouldn't you make it even if you didn't have the money? Isn't that the big trick that you didn't tell anybody? Yeah. Yeah. Um, congratulations. That's incredible. Look, if you want to go walk around, go to the bathroom, whatever, I say go for it. No, I don't want to anymore. Okay. Well, then we'll get engaged. How you been? Nine hours. <laughs> you look great. I like the tuxedo. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm good. Um, what have you been up to? Uh, I just finished a cartoon. I heard you uh, were in a movie I, that was fantastic. That I was in, I was in Kazakh's movie, by my friend Kazakh Redwanski's movie. That, that was out a while ago, but it just got released in New York, called Anne called? at 13,000 13, Feet. Yeah, that's the one. Someone said it was fantastic, and you were fantastic in it. Are you kidding? Hey, that's a hell of a compliment. Thank you. The real star was uh, was the lead. Like, uh, like, like she she was working with her was like her name's Dara Campbell, and uh, she was just a force of nature. Like, all I had to do was show up. I imagine it would be like what it's like being in one of your films, where you just show up and be yourself. Mm. Cool. And but what are you working on for yourself? I, I just finished a, like a cartoon, almost like a children's cartoon for Amazon that, that my friends and I finished maybe three weeks ago. And it comes out next week uh, on Amazon. It's oh. like, yeah, did, you, did you ever watch our show Nirvana the Band? Did... Yes. Not the... Okay. Yeah. So it's exactly like, well, I shouldn't say it's exactly like Nirvana the Band the show, but it is like Nirvana the Band the show, except we're a cartoon bird and a cartoon monkey trying to constantly escape a zoo. It's sort of like, it's like a retelling of the myth of Gilgamesh over and over and over and over and over again, in the same way that a lot of my work is. Can you, can you remind us what the myth of Gilgamesh is? Yeah, Gilgamesh is like, I wanna live forever. So I'm gonna leave my kingdom and go out to find the secret of eternal life. Huh. And it, it, I'm, I'm truncating it hugely here by the way like his best friend dies like he has to fight outside a city but the interesting thing to me is he goes out on his mission and he's like i'm going to conquer death i'm going to live forever and then he meets all these wise people that give him different impossible missions and every single one he fails at they say stay awake for seven days and he falls asleep on the first day every every single thing he tries to do he fails at and he's like fuck it i can't do it it's impossible so he goes home and as he returns and sees his kingdom he starts to cry and he can't believe how beautiful it is. And he can't believe that he ever left. And he realizes that just to live in the place that he used to hate and was bored of will be enough. And he will just do great acts. And so it's like, you know about this. It's like the refreshing nature of like adventure and failure and attempting to do impossible things only to return to your mundane, awful, boring life and feel as though it was a rebirth. And that's sort of what the, like me and my friend Jay are always doing in all of our work is like, we're idiots thinking that we need to escape ourselves only to fail and come back and realize, ah, you know, our life is actually good, but that needs to be constantly renewed. Your work is, is like very similar when I, when I, I think that's why I'm drawn to it so much. When I watch the show about the show, so much of it is you trying to transcend the situation you're in by creating so much chaos around you only to then in the next episode be like, why did I do this? Why am I making this show? But you have to keep doing it because otherwise there'd be nothing to live for. Um, that's the best uh, description of the, of the Epic of Gilgamesh I've ever heard. 
Um, like, you know, look, I get it completely wrong, and I'm a total moron also, right? Like, I know, I know very little about it. But the older I get, the more I realize that really, like, what things are actually about is much less important than what they are about to you. And that's something I wish I'd been told when I was younger, that, in fact, what it does for you, like, I may, I'm sure there's some Gilgamesh scholar who's going to be like, this moron has no idea what he's talking about. Sure. But it really doesn't matter because to me, that's such a useful myth and it's such a useful myth way of me seeing stories, specifically stories about that. Yeah, it reminds me of Fingon's Wake. It's kind of the same story too. I don't know. I've never read it. But I'm sure it is similar in that, that like, well, Gilgamesh is what, 2000 BC? That's an old one, baby. I heard a great story that when the guy who first translated it realized what it was. He got so excited he took all of his clothes off. Is this true? Yeah. Well, I mean, God knows. I wasn't there. It happened a long time ago. But the, the guy who first translated was like, oh my God, I found something so incredible and just started stripping. Is this what you brought me on here to talk about though, Colin? What, what year is that you think? That he, we could figure this out. Come on. I, it, like I'm sure whatever whatever scholar on what would that when have been Aramaic? Oh, uh, when it was no, it would have been Babylonian, right? Ancient Babylonian. Yeah, yes, see. So, but this this would have been like way way after because I think it was discovered on clay tablets. I yeah. think that's the point of it. Yeah, that it was like he, the original myth was discovered on clay tablets, but I don't know when this was. Probably in the last two hundred years. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> I was wondering what they were wearing. Um, oh, I see. You're trying to picture and forgot how perverted you are you're trying to literally think of what the guy was ripping off his body yes um so um i have no well so i thought maybe we'd talk about how we how we know each other yeah okay yeah let's do it do you want to go first i i i, I well i knew you because my friend jared rab was like matt you got to see this show i live in toronto and um, we watched the show about the show on YouTube and I couldn't believe what I was watching. And then I don't know why this happened, but I got asked to write an article for CinemaScope. They were asking uh, like a number, Mark Perenson, who's the editor of CinemaScope, which is an incredible magazine, if anybody's watching. I agree. Is wondering about, about, uh, uh, like the best film magazine, right? Yeah, by far. It's, it's eminently readable, I'll say. And he'd asked a bunch of filmmakers to write articles about maybe working filmmakers or contemporary filmmakers that they they looked up to. And I wrote an article about you and my experience watching your work and how r relatable I found it. And then I assume that you maybe read that or you'd heard about it because you must be friends with Mark Perenson. And then you had asked if I would come and speak in your class, I think. Although looking back on it, I, I think I'm seeing it now through the lens of you viewing me as yet another opportunity to find ways to sell your show to some higher power, like to some studio. I don't mean that cynically. I don't mean that cynically. I just mean you're you're all you're always selling. And so I think a part of it may have may have had something to do with that. And I went to your class and it was a crazy class because it was so political. And, I, and you had just had an argument with a girl about something that I don't know, but I just arrived, I came into the class. And it's like this, this very political conflict had just ended. And I, of course, had my normal, like moronic energy where I was just kind of saying whatever bellicose nonsense and being like, hey guys, isn't your professor amazing? Can you believe what a crazy guy this is? And that was definitely not the vibe that these students were looking for at the time, <laughs> at least the ones who'd just been in this conflict. And then after that, I said, hey, you should, it would be really great if you spoke in our class, the class in Toronto uh, that I teach with my producer, Matt Miller, and you came to that. And outside of that, I haven't really talked with you much, but we had long discussions in both those classes that I still think of. They're, they're, they're uh, quite beautiful, at least to me. Yeah, my, my, my memory is, um, I think, Stefan, who shoots the show, said, oh, somebody wrote a piece about you in CinemaScope. And he sent me, a, oh, he sent me a copy of it. And, and I read it and I was like, this guy is attacking me, right? This is an <laughs> attack. And it was like, it was so hard to tell. Is this, like you would sort of praise me, then you would like attack me, then you would praise me, then you would attack me. And I couldn't tell if you were setting me up to attack me or attacking me to praise me. And yes, yeah, welcome to the truth. <laughs> And I remember being a little bit annoyed by the a lot of it, 
And, but I was also baffled. I was like, hey, what is this? What's this guy saying? And uh, I think I asked Mark for your email address and he gave it to me. And, oh no, so, so I, I read it. And then one of the people who helped me is this guy, Bailey. And Bailey was like, uh, oh my God, Matt Johnson, he's incredible. And he was like raving about your work. And I was like, oh, so this guy's good? And he's like, yeah, he's amazing. So I was like, okay, um, <laughs> let me read it again. <laughs> and then uh, I was like, okay, if he's so fucking amazing, let me see what, what, what Let's see if he says this stuff to my face, if this guy's so amazing, Bailey. Well, I just wanted to see it. I just wanted to see what it was. And uh, I don't have much time to watch movies because uh, I, I work so much. But, uh, you know, my classes are an opportunity for me to watch movies that I want to see. So I just wanted to that's see. Right. Yeah, yeah. You show the dirties to your class. I remember that's why I was in the class. Yeah, we talked about yeah. the dirties. But yeah. I, I, never, I had never seen it. So I was just like, you know, what is this guy? And uh, I really liked it. And I really liked you. Um, so, um, so, yeah, I was. And then, and then I, I think I reached out to you because I was trying to like, yeah, I asked you for help to like get the show. Hustling. Yeah, we, we, we shared many emails, as I imagine you do with, with many of the, the, the friends you make. It, like, it, it, I think you were trying to either make a connection with Vice, maybe with Spike Jones. Spike Jones. Or, yeah. Um, who you, I, I know from the show, you, you yeah. were attempted having that meeting with, and then he was so afraid of meeting with you because he figured that he would be in the show. I've had many meetings with, he was the executive producer on, on our TV show, Nirvana the Band the Show, and was insanely supportive. In fact, the whole reason we, it, it in many ways, got to make that show the way that we did was because he, he supported it. And um, I can picture the idea, because he's a very, I don't want to say vulnerable, but he, there's not a lot of bullshit to him. Uh, if you ever met him, like he's very upfront. And I imagine that the idea of being in a conversation with you where your camera, quote unquote, is rolling the whole time would make his persona need to solidify in such a way that he would worry that he couldn't be himself. And I wonder if that is the more, or I should say the less cynical reading of why someone like him wouldn't want to sit down for any type of uh, meeting with you because it would be like, oh, I would need to be pure persona because if I wasn't, then I could be exposed in a way that I don't know if I'm comfortable with. Yeah, you know, I taught a class on uh, adaptation, just on the movie, the whole semester mm -hmm. about adaptation. And, uh, and I reached out to him and he came to my class and he, he brought his dog <laughs> and- yeah, His dog was at all our meetings too. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and he was great. I mean, he was so sweet and so kind and so, you know, accessible and unpretentious. He, 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 to me, I, what I would say is that he perfectly represents that idea of the filmmaker as child. You do as well, though. And it's something that I really appreciate about all your work is that I, the filmmakers that I really love where I'm like, oh, my gosh, this person's really doing it is that they have completely recaptured their adolescence in their personality in the present moment. You feel as though you're you're talking to somebody is who is excited as they as though they still were a child. And and that's very difficult to fake. Right. It's very difficult to have that kind of wide eyed, wondering curiosity, true curiosity that is put on. In fact, uh, it's almost impossible to do And he doesn't do it and neither do you. Well, you're kind of that way too. I would, uh, yeah, actually, I think I have a brain injury. <laughs> um, but, but you have like a, I mean, I think my students were really, were really inspired by you. Like you were so like, and you said such good things. You said like, uh, you're like one of my favorite guests ever. Um, you said this thing like, uh, there's only, there's a movie that you could make you're talking to the students. That only I know exactly. I know, yeah, because I say this often. And it's not there's a movie that only you can make. It's, in fact, the secret to a true first feature that is going to make a real difference is that you actually need to figure out the movie that you can make with the resources you have that would be better than if you gave the same concept, same script, same everything to Steven Spielberg and $100 million. And that needs to be literally true. The movie that you can make that will be truly great will be the one that you can do better with the resources you have. And that will be better than somebody with infinite resources. And if that's not true, then you are missing a mark in where, where you should be right now. And, and I would say your life and work is a platonic example of this. Like it actually couldn't be clearer than watching the show about the show because there is nobody else with any amount of resources who could be doing that better. And I think young people, when they think about storytelling, I would say getting into almost any art, is that they're so concerned with 
living up to a standard or making a bar or achieving a certain level of professionalism or anything that they lose sight of what's in front of them, which is their own life and the things that they know that nobody else knows. Especially nowadays when there's such a culture of, I don't wanna say self-hatred, but true self-doubt and anxiety and feeling like, well, who am I? I'm nobody, nobody should ever hear what I have to say. And that's like, tr like truly the death of any real storytelling because especially for first features, there's, there's nothing more important. You feel like people are, are less confident than they used to be? I think that, well, you, I, I, you must agree that there's, there's a, a concept that, that now, like what gives you the right to say anything almost. Also, there's a, such a fear of being like, being seen as though you're trying right? Like you, you can't, you can't get made fun of, or you can't be like deemed pathetic by anybody. If you never try, this is, that's almost a cliche. That's like such a sophomore way of putting it. But, but I certainly notice this with, with students more than I did when I was say an undergrad, that there is a deep fear of being seen as like trying too hard and then failing. It be, it, mostly because so much of life these days is about images and like what you appear to be doing. And as soon as you actually do something where it's like, no, I really did put my heart and soul into this. I really did. I really care what you think about this. Like that's a very vulnerable place to be, especially when you're in your 20s. One of my, uh, one of my idols is, is Frank Black, you know, from the Pixies. Yeah, of course. And I think of him as somebody who's like supremely confident. And I feel like uh, what he's teaching is confidence, you know, like, the songs are so confident, you know, and he has this one. It's so ugly. <laughs> well, uh, um, it, this, it's a kind of beauty in in ugliness or in that kind. You of will, no, that's my point. That, that 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 it's married to the confidence, right? You know, yeah. like like really having confidence. Like the truly confident person is the person with the crazy scar who yeah. acts like it doesn't bother them, right? And Frank yeah, Black yeah, yeah, is yeah. such a perfect example of that. Yeah, he was saying once in an interview, like. Um, he wrote a song for an album. It's called Jeffrey with one F. Do you know that song? No. It just goes, this, the lyrics are Jeffrey with one F, Jeffrey with one F, Jeffrey, Jeffrey. And then just that over and over again, right? And the sound engineer said something like, uh, not one of your most more inspired lyrics. <laughs> and, and Frank Black said, no, that's my most inspired lyric ever. And I was like, <laughs> Oh, he's right, because who would say that? Jeffrey with one F, Jeffrey, you know, like to think that that was like enough was so insanely confident. And to not care that the sound engineer was calling him out right like that. Now look, you teeter on, um, like I still believe there needs to be some kind of cross section of commercialism and commercial interests when, and I don't mean that so cynically, but I mean like people do need to be responding to it still. So you don't want to go too far down the black hole of thinking like I will make the most esoteric decision ever and stick by it. And that's going to be my vision. Like th that, yeah, I haven't heard the song. I mean, I, I love, I love all of his music, but, um, but I, I, I'm, I'm basically playing devil's advocate here to turn this into a discussion as opposed to just blindly agreeing with everything you say, Kyle. No, no, I agree with you. I mean, I've had students who are like, this is great. And I'm like, no, no, it's not. I know, it's the worst. <laughs> and you know, what? me and Miller have, a, have sort of a rule where at the beginning of the year, we're kind of like, okay, if you want us to tell you the truth, you need to make that clear to us. And if you don't want us to tell that, you the truth, also make that clear to us. You don't need to say, I'm a coward, I can't take it. And you don't need to say, break my heart, make me cry. You don't need to say that, but you need to indicate one way or another how you want feedback to happen. Because most young people, are presenting work in an academic setting with the intention of getting you to like it as opposed to really having it well, like not knowing and being like, I'm trying to get this to work. Is it working? It, 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 it's a, and anyway, the people who are like, yeah, 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 I'm listening and I want this to be as good as possible no matter what and can let their ego go. Really, I mean, I'm not sure how you feel, but do the best in those academic settings. And the ones who are like, I just want to get through this class and I would prefer not hearing any criticism that I can't fix. It's a very different, very different situation. Yeah, um, I, it's interesting that you give them that choice and I never give them that choice, um, but that's interesting. Um, yeah, what do you do? You just, you're just giving them the truth no matter what? Yeah. I, I don't know. 
I, I, when I was in your class, I got the sense that there were certain people that you were just like, oh, I can't be bothered with them. And you just don't give them any feedback. The hundred person class? <laughs> that that, yes, believe it or not. I got the sense that there's certain personalities in there that would oh, be so right. like, like trying to bait you and trying to be like, well, I'm doing this. What do you think about this? That you wouldn't be like, you're not going to follow them down the road. You're just going to be like, oh, that sounds great. Yeah, go ahead. Do that. I encourage you to explore that. I see. I see. I see. Um, are you a full-time professor? No, no. We teach one class. We do it, it like, like very, very part-time. We teach the graduating fiction filmmaking class at the York University in Toronto. And it's, it's like a labor of love. Like we, we started doing it like four years ago. I live in Canada and it's a very different system here. And we did some work with the federal government trying to develop a first features program for young people to make movies in this country because both Matt Miller, my producer and I are like very, we believe strongly in the idea of making first features for no money at a wide scale with national funds. And that led to us being like, well, maybe we should teach a class because we're, we're not so far to film school that we forget what it was like. And I think there are certain things that I wish I had heard when I was a student um, that just seemed like a, a good opportunity now while we're still working to, to go to try to help young people. It's not, I mean, it's not meant to be uh, altruistic in that way, but I'm sure you've been teaching a long time. You, you're probably getting more out of it personally as an artist than you think you're giving away. Certainly that's the way it is with me. Yeah. It completely changed my life. Oh, good. You like it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was on, I, I had a sabbatical semester once. Uh, you know, after seven years, they give you a semester off of, of paid, a paid semester. I've heard of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I, I was kind of so excited. Like, I don't have to teach. I can just collect my, my salary and just work on my films. And I was like really depressed that semester. Like I was like, oh Jesus, I actually am happier when I'm teaching than when I'm not. Yeah, you're surrounded by meaning in a classroom. It's, yeah. it's an incredible feeling. And then it's, as soon as you're divorced from that, there's something, well, yeah. I mean, you, you're, you're a great mentor, at least from what I can see in your work. And like not having that, once you've done something, I think is almost a crime. Like there should be a kind of, mentorship is kind of what feeds you at a great point in your, in your adult life. And, and it helps you to refine and crystallize what you know about yourself. Because in this society, you're not given many opportunities to kind of pontificate on the things that you already know. And yet a classroom with people who really are trying to figure these things out is a perfect opportunity for you to figure out what it is that you believe, right? Unless you're an author or like you're a public speaker or anything like that. Like there are very few opportunities given to you where you can figure out what you think about your own life and the work that you've done in a public forum in an almost improvised setting where it will actually be helpful to people and not just a pretentious exercise in what's that word uh never mind but you understand my point i do um so the new film you made is a is a feature or short a tv show the the new no it's, it's like a cartoon series that my friend and i made and it's going to be on amazon and it's it's for kids. It's going to be on Amazon, like Kids Plus in a week, and then Amazon Prime in October. But we just made it over the pandemic. Like we made it over the last eight months. How many episodes? Uh, there's only three that are going up next week, but I think we're going to make a lot more. Like I think, I think we're going to make a ton. How long is each one? Uh, they're between, they're all under 20 minutes. Each one's like, like 11 minutes long. Oh. But, but they vary. They vary. They vary. It's hard to imagine that it would be kid friendly. You should watch it. You know what? It's a lot. Well, this might not be from your generation. It's a lot like the show Pinky and the Brain mixed with Calvin and Hobbes, which I'm sure you know. Did you read any Calvin and Hobbes? Calvin? Yeah. 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 So it's ba we basically tried to make Calvin and Hobbes as a as a cartoon show. Uh -huh. that, that was our big inspiration. But it, I mean, it's kid friendly in that we don't swear. Um, but. But yeah. Oh, can you say what the name of the show is? Yeah, oh yeah, sorry. The show's called Matt and Bird Break Loose. Matt and Bird Break Loose? Yes. Okay. You look as though you're being interrogated, Kave. Well, people are telling me things here. Oh, yeah. They, they, want me, they want me to end this conversation so we can switch it out. But I want to play a clip from uh, The Dirties. 
Can you, I do that? You can do it if you want. I want to. Can you see this? You're gonna play the opening scene of this movie? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Can you can you hear me from there? Can you hear me from there? These things are amazing. This was the best thing we ever bought. Can you hear me? 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 Sorry. We're making a movie. You're making a movie too? Yeah. About what? It's a horror film. You're kidding me. No. We're making a movie about bullies in our school. Oh. What's your movie about? Okay, so ours is about this monster, and he is killing So basically, our last we just so basically he's um he's he's a murderer. And there's this secret government agency, and they were sent out to um, find the killer and um, arrest him. And then, because they, they don't know it's a monster until they find out later. That, and then there's also these two detectives who uh, are now dead, but who are like, and they're from England, and they both got brutally murdered in a forest. This and is insane. Yeah. Our movie is about two students in a school who get bullied by this gang called the Dirties, and so they decide to take revenge on them by killing them. Yeah, they basically get this huge military and they go and they, they, they snipe them from a long way away and then they go to this club called the Rectum and they kill them there and oh. yeah, you oh it's amazing. It, it's the same club from Irreversible. And then there's a scene where Okay, hey, yeah, there. That's it's the opening scene of the first film. <laughs> um I I just wanted to show that for people who don't don't know your work. Um, you know why it's it, it's a little bit like like your show except we try to like we're not trying to recreate it we're just trying to have it be on the first take like we're trying to film the rehearsal of yeah. of the show of what the show would be and that's why it's all with people who don't know they're on camera with really long lenses trying to capture as much real life as we can um we have to stop but i want to say thank you for coming and also i really like you i, I would love to hang out with you Sometimes yeah, you, uh, you don't flirt with me, Kaveh. It's not going to work. I'm not, I'm not going to fall under your spell like all these other 20 something girls. Nah, no way. If you're ever in New York, uh, um, or if you can invite me to Toronto. Sure. Hey, look, next chance I get, I, I'm sure we'll run into one another. It would be great one day to be in one of one another's films. I think that would really be a treat. I think it'd be a lot of fun, but, but uh, enjoy the night and don't stay up too late because you're going to, come on. You gotta get to bed, man. <laughs> the the constant looking like off camera like this really does create a feeling of like you are the prisoner. <laughs> Which in a sense, I think you are. Good night, my friend. H have a great night. Thank you, you too. Later, buddy. Bye, man.